Was the Cold War the Earth's worst environmental disaster? The apocalypse did not come, but vast areas of the world have been ravaged beyond repair as a direct result of nuclear and conventional weapons testing. In America, the end of the world was rehearsed in the Great Basin, a rolling expanse of desert connecting the western states of California, Nevada and Utah. The military controls four million acres of this land, home to America's main nuclear test site and a dumping ground for conventional bombs since the 1950s. Richard Mizrach has been photographing this war zone for 10 years. For me, the desert has always been very, very much part of America's identity. And I'm very interested in the cultural landscape as opposed to the natural landscape. Like many photographers before him, Mizrach was first drawn to the deserts of the American West by their epic beauty. It was almost by accident, as he worked his way north from the mythic deserts nearest Los Angeles, that he crossed into the heart of the Pentagon's desert. In the late uh, 70s, I, I began photographing in the desert again mostly things like fires and floods and, and different, different situations where civilization and nature collided, you know, where, where there's a clash of, of these, these two powerful forces. And in my travels looking around the deserts, I kept running into military reservations. I would see these beautiful landscapes, try to go to them, and they'd be uh, fenced off. At one point, I was actually photographing instantly near Yuma, uh, Marine base, and they arrested me, and they actually uh, took me to uh, the barracks and uh, kept me for five, six hours. They called in uh, intelligence agents to come and interview me to find out what I was doing, and they threatened to actually ruin my film of the last month. And that really, that experience made me realize just how omnipresent the military had become in the American desert. And then I kept going, and I think it was 1986, when I be began thinking about the military in earnest, and that was uh, right around the time of Chernobyl. I had heard a lot about that. That was on, on the radio a lot, uh, right at the time I was traveling through the desert. And I thought, God, I should really photograph the nuclear test site. But it, at that time, I continued on on a trip that I had planned to go to the Great Salt Lake in Utah. And en route there, I discovered uh, a little-known Air Force base called Wendover. People told me that the hangar of the Enola Gay was there. And the Enola Gay was the bomber that dropped, literally dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. And it turns out that the crew uh, for the Enola Gay and the other bomber that dropped the bomb on Nagasaki actually trained at Wendover. So I explored it and I researched it a little more and I went around the base and photographed the hangar of the Enola Gay. And I uh, started talking to people and I realized that the Pentagon actually kept this place top secret. One of the things that they did at Wendover was they worked out a lot of the engineering details for the dropping of the atomic bomb. The atomic bombs were so huge, they would not fit into the conventional bombers at that time. So what they had to do was create a pit in the ground where they would put the bomb in on a hydraulic um, uh, force, roll the bomber over it, and then with the hydraulic, push the bomb into the belly of the plane because the bomb, if it was sitting on the ground, couldn't clear. Things like that, which don't seem somewhat trivial, but were crucial. One of the things interesting about Wendover is this, there's all this architecture left over since World War II. It's so, sort of like uh, California ghost towns. It has that kind of quality. There are dilapidated buildings and old architectural remnants. I'd read some accounts of um, the Hiroshima bombing, and there was this one particular account that, that really affected me. It was, 
It was about how the thermal rays from the atomic bomb had actually imprinted the kimono onto the skin, the patterns of the kimono onto the skin of a woman. And somehow I felt that the, that the photograph here of the sort of innocence of the thermal rays on this old dilapidated building, the sort of nostalgic sentimental value is sort of pretty, sort of was a sort of a terrible counterpart to the, the real horror that went on in Hiroshima. The way I discovered Bravo 20 was sort of by the back road. Originally, I was actually looking to do work on, at the nuclear test site in Nevada. And I was told about an activist organization in Nevada. And I went and talked to them about the nuclear test site. And they actually diverted me to other issues facing Nevada that didn't have nothing to do with the nuclear test site. Ultimately, I met a man named Dr. Richard Bargan, uh, who told me about Bravo 20. He said that there's a bombing range that the Navy had been bombing illegally for 40 years, and that's a really nice place to go have a picnic, and would I like to go? As you're getting close to it, you see Lone Rock, uh, this volcanic cinder cone that's coming like a, like a pyramid coming out of, out of this vast alkali flat. It's quite beautiful, actually. And as you get really close, you drive and you kick up this, this talcum-like dust behind you and have huge plumes of dust. It's quite beautiful, too. And it's no big deal until you get very close to, to Lone Rock itself when all of a sudden you start seeing bombs and craters. And as you get closer, you see, first you see just a couple, then you see more and more. And pretty soon you're seeing crater on crater on crater. You can't even distinguish where one crater starts because they've been bombed so many times. It turns out that the Navy's been bombing there on a daily basis since the 40s. And for many of those years, they didn't have the legal right to be bombing out there. And that night, I camped. It was really quite beautiful, but I was really nervous. Uh, I didn't know if they were going to start bombing again. This was all new to me. I didn't know if bombs could just go off on their own. I didn't know if Kodak, my 90-pound German Shepherd, would just like step on a pin or something and set it off. And the shrapnel all around was like razor blades. I mean, it was just wall-to-wall -wall shrapnel, blowing up uh, vehicles and bombs. Originally, Lone Rock, or Wolf's Head, was 260 feet tall. And after 40 years of bombing, it's now down to 160 feet tall. But still, it's fairly steep. And you get to the top, and all around you, you see the Carson Sink, which is this vast alkali flat. And in the far distance, you have the Stillwater Mountains range on one end and the Humboldt Mountains on the other. And um, it's just such a vast open space. You can actually see the curve of the Earth. Thousands of bombs, apparently, are underneath the surface. Over the years, the sand shifts and covers the different bombs. And it's interesting, what happens when the bomb is dropped, it comes in nose first, of course. As it goes into the ground, it may hit something or different strata and deflect and come back out. And that's why you get them coming and pointing out. And you'll see that quite often. It's quite a strange sight to see these bombs emerging back out. Here we have hundreds of dead fish right on the bombing range itself. What happened is in the early 80s, it was heavy rains for a long period of time. Bravo 20 turned into a lake, which the Navy in their environmental study said couldn't happen. When it turned into a lake, the fish from the Stillwater Wildlife Refuge swam up, and when the waters receded, were left stranded. What I believe also happened at that time is that all these toxics, the napalm, phosphorus, uh, jet fuel, and all the, the ingredients in the bombs leached into the water table and went back to the wildlife refuge and in fact caused a huge 
a terrible die-off in the, in the mid-80s. It was a perfect symbol of the kind of destruction that the military had wrought over America in general. It was a piece of land that nobody seemed to really care about that much, and, and this, this violence had been wrecked upon it uh, for years and years and years. And it, it seemed to be a perfect em environmental statement about the way we've become as a nation. What concerns me is that, particularly now with the Cold War over, particularly with the return to the right where they actually want to increase the military budget again, what concerns me is that I don't think we recognize just how militarized we've become as a society, how dependent we are on military economics and the side effects, the fallout. It's not nuclear, it's cultural.